Good morning, Central Church family, friends, followers online. It, uh, it's been an interesting week. Um, that's probably the mother of all understatements. Uh, before I, I go into my main thoughts, I just want to share a couple of scriptures and um, have a prayer. Try to make sure, try to help at least prepare our hearts and minds to be in the, the appropriate place for hearing the word of God proclaimed. Psalm 146 says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Put not your trust in princes, it says, or in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Who is our trust and who is our hope in today? 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Please pray with me. Loving and gracious Father in heaven, as we prepare to come together to consider what our whole duty is to you in this life, push less noble thoughts out of our hearts. Focus our attention on you. Focus our attention on your goodness and your wisdom and your sovereignty and your power and on your eternal purpose. Remind us always, Father, that as your scriptures teach, we have not here a lasting city. We are looking for the city that is to come. We are looking and our hope, our living hope is Christ Jesus and glory and the new heavens and new earth where righteousness is at home. Until then, we live as aliens and strangers called only to spread the gospel and to seek the peace of the city in which you have placed us. 
Father, may your spirit soften our hearts. May you prune our lives so that we may pursue these things that you have made us for and called us to. And it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. So our theme for 2021 is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now next week, we'll be starting a series on the Ten Commandments, specifically how we, how we understand them in light of Christ. Now those are God's moral laws, and they teach us how to glorify God and enjoy God in all of life. But today, we're going to be focusing on this idea of enjoying God, now and forever. Our scripture for today is Psalm 73, verses 24 through 26. It is written, You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. The word of the Lord. This psalm points us to the deepest needs of our soul and the fact that nothing in this world can fulfill them. That's why it says that God is our portion forever. When it says God is our portion, I want you to think of it kind of like when you're eating a, a big Thanksgiving dinner or a Christmas dinner and you heap giant helpings of delicious food on your plate and you get all fat and sassy, right? God fulfills us like that, now and forever. That's why the psalmist here tells us that God is his only desire, his ultimate desire in heaven or on earth. This psalmist is saying, I live to enjoy God. Once again, please join me in prayer. Lord, the world promises us so many things that will fulfill us, but it's all false advertising. You alone can satisfy the most noble cravings of our hearts because you have made us for yourself. Lord, teach us to say, like the psalmist, that we desire nothing and no one on earth or in heaven as we desire you. May your spirit stir up longings in us that only you can fulfill and draw us into deeper fellowship with you. May our thoughts, our worship, and our lives bring glory to you, and as we glorify you, may we come to enjoy you above all else. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now the root of the word enjoy is joy. All true joy comes from God's hand alone. He is the giver of every good and perfect gift, James 1.17. Now, C.S. Lewis is someone who understood that very well. Most people know of Lewis as the author of the Narnia books. He also wrote science fiction novels. He was also one of the world's leading scholars of classic English literature in his day. And on top of that... He was probably the greatest explainer and defender of the Christian faith in the 20th century. And joy was something he wrote about a lot because Lewis believed that the Christian life ought to be just saturated and overflowing with joy. He understood that humans were created to enjoy God now and forever. Here's one of my favorite things that Lewis ever wrote about joy. It's from his book, The Weight of Glory. Listen to what he says here. We shall eat from the tree of life. At present, if we are reborn in Christ, the spirit in us lives directly on God. But the mind, and still more the body, receives from him the faint, far-off, implanted, um, excuse me, the faint far off results of those energies which God's creative rapture implanted in matter when he made the worlds or what we now call physical pleasures and even thus filtered, they are too much 
for our present management. In other words, what Lewis was saying is way, way back at the dawn of time, God made this physical world for our physical bodies to enjoy. God created the green grass and the sweet, delicious fruits and gentle breezes. He set into motion the glorious sunrises and sunsets. He made husband and wife to enjoy one another. And yet, even those joys can overwhelm our senses. How can we ever begin to imagine the thought of eternal life, enjoying God face to face forever? The joys of this present life are just rumors and shadows of the joy which is to come. But then Lewis goes on to say, what would it be to taste at the fountainhead of that stream of which even these lower reaches prove so intoxicating? Yet, that, I believe, is what lies before us. In other words, Lewis is saying that even the deepest and purest and most satisfying joys that we can know in this life are merely a trickle when compared to the eternal fountain of joy we will drink from in eternity. Here's where I really want to draw your attention. Lewis concludes that the whole man, that is spirit, soul, and body, remember we will be resurrected with bodies, the whole man is to drink from the fountain of joy. And that's what the old Puritans at Westminster meant when they said our chief end is to enjoy God forever. In this life, we drink little sips that trickle downstream from the eternal joy that is ours in glory. But when we are raised to eternal life, our whole being will constantly drink from the very fountain of joy, and that fountain of joy is God himself. Our reading today calls us to consider this. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. This passage teaches us that there is a twofold enjoying of God, first in this life, and second in the life to come. When it says that earth has nothing I desire besides you, it means all joy here and now in this life comes from God. We were made to enjoy sweet fellowship with God in this life. And when it says, whom have I in heaven but you, that's pointing us to an eternal joy that will be ours in the life to come, when we will commune with God in glory and so enjoy him forever. So first, let's talk about enjoying God in this life. Enjoying God in this life. If you know how Genesis tells the story of the earliest days of humans, you remember that God placed Adam and Eve in a lush garden with a river running through it, with gold and precious gems in the land and delicious fruit trees all around them. There in Eden, they were in perfect fellowship with one another and in perfect communion with God. They were always welcomed in God's royal gardens and God himself would come visit them. You see, we were created to enjoy God, to enjoy fellowship with Him, to commune with Him. We lost that perfect fellowship and the perfect joy that came with it when our first parents rebelled and plunged us all into sin. Ever since that day, we have all, all humanity, lived east of Eden just fighting to live, searching for scraps of joy as we struggle with the thorns and thistles of sin and sorrow and death. You see, you were born homesick for Eden. There's something in the hearts of God's people that's always longing to get back home to where God is 
where the only true and lasting joy can be found. But what often happens in this life is that we settle for lesser joys or for stolen joys, even for false joys. We stop looking for it in God. We look for joy in ourselves, in our accomplishments, in our relationships, in our money, in our politics, in our play, in the likes we get on Instagram. We try and find satisfaction everywhere but God. Now the preacher of Ecclesiastes, if you're familiar with Ecclesiastes, already tried that before us. He searched for joy everywhere under the sun, as he says. That is, in every nook and cranny of this world. But he came away sorrowful and bitter. And so he declared, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You know, God put that in the Bible. So you and I wouldn't have to go through all of that. We should learn from the preacher. We can't be satisfied in our pursuit of joy without God because, as C.S. Lewis reminds us, we heard earlier, God is the fountainhead of all true joy. St. Augustine famously said that God created us for himself and our hearts are restless until they finally rest in him. Our chief end is is to enjoy God forever. And that doesn't just mean in the far off distant future. Forever includes now, in this life. No, it's not the same quality of joy that we will know in eternity, but even now we can take joy in loving fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 1 John 1, 3, truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are drawn into fellowship with God the Father through Jesus the Son by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 calls it the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. How do we enjoy God even now in this life? How can we drink from the quiet springs of fellowship with God and satisfy our spiritual dryness and thirst until we drink from the fountainhead of joy and glory? God has actually given his people many ways to enjoy him. They're simple. They're in the Bible. And unfortunately, they often go overlooked because I guess they're not spicy enough. Past generations of Christians called these, these easy, uh, simple ways to fellowship with God, they call them the ordinary means of grace. The emphasis is on that word ordinary. They're the stuff that ordinary Christians should be ordinarily doing. Ray Ortland says that the ordinary means of grace are where God has concentrated his availability like a gushing fountain of mercy for sinners who are so desperately, or desperate, excuse me, that they are finally coming to Christ on his terms. In other words, God is always present in these ordinary means of grace. They're the ordinary places that you can go where you will be sure that you will find God. And when you find Him there, you enjoy Him there. The first is in God's Word. Whether you're hearing it preached or immersing yourself in the study of the Scriptures, alone or with others, after Jesus preached to His disciples on the road to Emmaus, they said, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Luke 24, 32. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives life to the word of God in our hearts when it's preached or even in just reading it. You know, I heard about an old church in Scotland where whenever the Bible was opened and the scriptures were read aloud, I'm not even talking about in the preaching, I'm talking about just the scripture reading. 
church members were breaking into tears of joy. That's the fellowship of the Holy Spirit at work, drawing us into communion with God through Christ whenever we read or hear the Word. Ezekiel 36, 26 says that the Holy Spirit replaces your heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and the Word of God then comes to life in your softened heart. Your heart burns within you. You find joy in God's laws and in God's promises. Do you prepare yourself to hear the Word of God when it's read or when it's preached? Pray like the psalmist. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Proverbs 1, or excuse me, Psalm 119, verse 18. Receive the word of God in faith and with love, like newborn babies craves pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. 1 Peter 2, verse 2. Store up God's word in your heart like a precious treasure and strive to live by it. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 11. The Holy Spirit will inscribe God's words on your heart, and they will be alive, and they will be dwelling in you, and you will enjoy God more and more as His word dwells richly in you. Second way you can enjoy God in this life is through the sacraments. Now, that's not a word we use much. There are two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, what makes baptism and the Lord's Supper sacraments? What even is a sacrament? Now, the Heidelberg Catechism gives a really helpful definition of sacrament. Sacraments are holy, visible signs and seals. In other words, they are things that we see. They are things that we experience with our bodies. They were instituted by God. We don't just decide that these are good things to do. God gave them to us and commanded us to do them so that by their use, he might more fully declare and seal us to the promise of the gospel. In other words, God actually uses baptism and the Lord's Supper to help us be more secure in our salvation and to have more joy in our Christian life. In ways that we can see and feel and participate in, baptism and the Lord's Supper boldly proclaim the gospel promise that God graciously grants us forgiveness of sins in everlasting life because of the one sacrifice that Christ accomplished on the cross. So the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, they always focus our faith on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation. When, in other words, when you went down into the waters of baptism, Romans 6 verse 3 says that you were baptized into Christ's death. Baptism is God's promise to you right there in the water that your sin has been dealt with forever at the cross. Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2 says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord does not count against them. There is no joy in this life like the joy of someone who felt the burden of her sin and misery and then experienced the freedom of forgiveness. If you have known this joy, you know the sun shines brighter, the songs of the birds are sweeter, the breeze whispers God's love and beauty to you. You know what that feeling is, that difference is? That's knowing that you are no longer walking under the frowning wrath of God. Now you are walking in God's smile. Galatians 3.27 says that all of you who are baptized into Christ have put or clothed yourselves with Christ. 
His righteousness now covers your sin. It is your robe that protects you from the chilly wind of Satan accusing you, using your own insecurities and shame to steal the joy from your faith. When the devil knows, listen, that he can't condemn you, he tries to destroy your joy. But you can tell him, you know what? You're right. I am a wretched and miserable sinner, but I am baptized. Not just I was baptized. God claimed you as his child in the waters of baptism. Now he says to every baptized believer what he said to Jesus after his baptism. This is my beloved child. This is my daughter. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. It's the smile of God on you. When you are walking with the smile of God the Father over you, you are enjoying God. God also gives us great joy in the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians 11.26 tells us that whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A bunch of other stuff, I think, I don't know, some of us get into the habit of proclaiming, but that's what this supper is about. Every week you come to be fed at Christ's table. You come and you taste and you see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34, 8. In the bread and in the wine, he imparts to you his own body and blood for your spiritual nourishment. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That means that for the rest of your days, you can boast and you can rest and you can find joy in knowing that you are forgiven. You are being made holy by God's Spirit, and you have hope of resurrection and eternal life. Every time you eat the bread and you drink the cup, you are feasting on God's promises to you in Christ. You are enjoying God. There are other ways, or ordinary means of grace, ways to enjoy God now that he has given Christians so that we can have days of heaven here on earth. There's prayer. I mean, intimate, adoring, pouring your life out to God prayer. There's the church gathered for worship in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. God is in all of these through his spirit and through these very ordinary means, the basic rhythms really of the Christian life, we can enjoy sweet fellowship with God even now. So real quick now, let's talk about enjoying God in the next life. Like C.S. Lewis said, we have a difficult time enough processing the little sips we get from the springs of joy in this life. How can we ever truly know in this life the eternal joy we will know in glory. When our eyes finally see God face to face, when we can at last drink from the fountainhead of all joy, and that is the presence of God Almighty Himself. Even the Bible acknowledges that our finite human minds are not able to comprehend the joy that will be ours. Right? It says, I hath not seen nor ear heard neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. But Scripture doesn't lead us uh, totally in the dark about our eternal joy either. It paints some very vivid pictures of the joy that will be ours forever in glory. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. We will be with the Lord forever, enjoying eternal pleasures from his hand. And we won't be angel babies floating on clouds or disembodied spirits floating in the ether. 
1 Corinthians 15 tells us we will have new bodies, bodies that are immortal, imperishable, and incorruptible. You will still be you, and I will still be me. We will be more fully ourselves in heaven than we ever were in this life. Our resurrected bodies will never again know sorrow or sin or sickness or death. God himself will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Revelation 21 verse 4. Isaiah 25 shows us all of God's redeemed, resurrected saints coming to a huge banquet, sitting in heaven's great dining hall, and while we feast on the richest foods and priceless wines, it says that God's dinner will be death. He will swallow it up forever. We can't even imagine that joy, really, because we live every day from birth under the shadow of death. But we are promised that on that day, God will destroy death forever. You know, one of my favorite promises from Scripture of the eternal joys to come is in a passage you probably wouldn't think of. It's Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 5 which is describing the heavenly city of God. And it says, The city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Don't you understand? Heaven is for humans. And among all the other glories, the eternal joys pouring from God's mighty hand forever, we will even see kids playing tag and jumping rope in safe city streets. Like we heard from C.S. Lewis earlier, the whole man, the whole person, body, soul, and spirit, is to drink from the fountain of joy. Now, if your vision of heaven is less joyful, less concrete, tangible, and real, and bodily than what I've just spelled out for you from the pages of Scripture itself, you're not going to have the joy you could have now in your Christian life. And that's really sad. Because God created you to enjoy Him forever. Not just in a far distant, hazy, eternal forever, but now and forever. Don't you see, church? It's the joys we're anticipating in the life to come that pour down from heaven, from eternity, from God. Fountainhead of all joy. It's those eternal joys we're anticipating that kindles joy in our hearts now. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, said that we shall... Never enjoy ourselves fully till we enjoy God eternally. Meanwhile, tomorrow is a Monday morning. This week we will be tempted, we will be hurt. We will have days this week where we find that our faith is thin and our love is chilly like the January wind. But you know what? You can still enjoy God and His Word. You can still remember that I am baptized. Walk with joy from the smile of God on you. And you can still drink, even if it's just sips, from the eternal joy God has promised in Christ to all of those who love him.